Doctor, please come and help. I think I'm I mute. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes. How do I get yes. on to me? So you can reach me at my cell phone okay. tomorrow. Yes, so. But now I'm on the And if your presentation for the flash, you just need to take it out. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Thank you very much. I've been worried. Hello, Thank you very much. So please be like. Oh, yes. Yes, I can hear you. Very well. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, please. Yeah, Eric, we can hear you as well. Okay, very well. Good morning. Good evening. Good morning over there. Sorry for later commencement of the session. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Very well. So can we have uh, Olanike Adelakun for our presentation? OK, thank you. Uh, so I'll share my screen now. Yeah. Okay, can you view my screen? Oh, yes. Can you view my screen? Can I? What did you say? Can you view my screen? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, um, good evening to you there. And uh, good morning to those joining uh, from wherever. Good day. I think it's safer to say good day. Uh, firstly, let me apologize for not being there in person. Uh, this is due to some visa logistics and uh, processing. Uh, but all the same, it's good that technology has made life easy for us. So um, my, okay, let me say her presentation. I'm actually co-present with Olaju Mate. Who is chairing this session. So our presentation is about um, querying uh, the structure of legal education in Nigeria and whether the structure is actually due for a reform. <clears throat> so in doing this, uh, we 
Sorry, I'm trying to go on full screen mode. And I may have to switch off my video because my bandwidth is a bit low. <laughs> okay, so basically we try to conceptualize um, legal education from the, uh, three different perspectives. We try to look at what legal education means to the law teachers. We try to look at what it means to the law students, and we try to look at what it means to the lay community. So, and then after that, we try to look at the structure of legal education as it is in Nigeria. And we try to look at the skills required for clinical legal education, which involves um, legal ethics. We try to look at recent developments in legal education in Nigeria, the major challenges, and then we concluded this um, session. So, uh, from the traditional perspective in Nigeria, clinical uh, legal education is basically uh, the, the teaching of substantive law. And uh, until very recently, like uh, about one and a half decades ago, or less than that. The idea of uh, clinical legal education was referring to uh, clinical legal education in Nigeria. So it's all about um, the model that we took from our colonial masters, the British. So it's basically about teaching the substantive law at the graduate level, and teaching the procedural law at the, at the law school level. That is like a postgraduate level, but not like master's level per se. So basically at the undergraduate level, the law teachers are basically focused on teaching the substantive law, the principles, the criticisms, and the likes, without actually putting all this knowledge into practice by engaging the students in solving real life situations or challenges or social problems with their knowledge of the law. And then to the students, uh, the idea of legal education to the students actually depends on what they are able to get from their teachers, from their law teachers. So to some students, it's all about, okay, knowing the concept of law, knowing the principles involved, being able to give it back the way it was taught, or being able to like replicate the knowledge that was passed out in order to pass the examinations. And that is why you say a lot of people struggle at the law school level and then when they get to the field. So it becomes a challenge for them to actually translate their uh, substantive knowledge of the law into practice. And then to the other community <clears throat> member, the concept of legal education is just like, oh, what lawyers do to become lawyers. And when you talk about um, clinical legal education to them, they don't even understand the idea of cleaning in legal profession. So it's always associated with uh, medical field and health sciences. So it's still an evolving concept in so many African countries, including Nigeria. So it takes uh, a lot of effort for non-lawyers, members of the community to actually understand that. Oh, when you talk about legal education, you can actually bring that to their level and to also solve their problems. But of course, things are beginning to change. So we can safely say that oh, legal education in most African countries is all about teaching and learning the procedural and the substantive law with the creativity that teachers are able to bring in. And for those that adopt or embrace clinical legal education, yes, it's taking a new shape, a new life, a new face. Unfortunately, that is not uniform because the idea of clinical education, clinical legal education, even different. And it's basically based on the perception of the person trying to apply or adopt that approach into teaching and learning law. <clears throat> so uh, the structure of legal education in Nigeria is divided basically into two, the academic training and the professional training. So the academic training is basically the, um, the university level where you learn the substantive law. It's usually for five years. And for those that come in in their year two, probably because they have an advanced uh, level, uh, maybe a diploma or advanced uh, A-levels uh, certificate, then they spend two years because they skip the first year, 
which basically introduce law students to other fields like psychology, philosophy, sociology that are related to the study of law. But uh, after spending five years at the university level, I wouldn't draw so much on this because I know uh, Kenetriko mentioned all this earlier today. So after that, then students that are able to get their qualifying certificate or they are able to get their uh, certificate at the undergraduate level proceed to the Nigerian Law School for the professional training. And the professional training focuses on application like um, the applied law, the procedural law. How do you actually apply this knowledge to this? And uh, unfortunately, the focus still lies so much and heavily on litigation. Yes, yeah, there are elements of ADR and the like, but we still lay so much emphasis on litigation such that have great minded law students still believe that, oh, to succeed as a lawyer, you just have to have that litigation skills and you have to be able to like uh, litigate in court. So it's usually a year training. Uh, and for those that are foreign students that hold their first degree from another country, they go through a composite three months training first, which we usually call bar part one, before proceeding to the uh, one year procedural training. And uh, to regulate these programs, we have the Nigeria University Commission, that's AUC, and the Council of Legal Education. They are responsible, they are jointly responsible for the approval and accreditation of any law school, law faculty in this sense. We use the term law faculty in Nigeria, but it's synonymous with law school. But the concept of law school in Nigeria is like uh, the Nigerian law school that is responsible for the procedural training of law, uh, law students. So <clears throat> in terms of recent trends, uh, like I said earlier, clinical legal education is still a recent development. Recent because it's still less than two decades in Nigeria. So, and then when you look at some university and the approach is not uniform, the methodology is not uniform, the end result is not uniform, the target is not uniform. So you have some universities introducing uh, clinical legal education from year one, while some way to like third year of undergraduate study before they introduce, while some universities don't even bother to introduce it strictly. And then the students are faced with the idea of clinical legal education for the first time at the Nigerian law school. And then uh, to some people, clinical legal education is just about engaging students in the classroom, like uh, a kind of interactive sessions in the classroom. While to us, to others, it goes beyond that. It's all about, uh, it, it, it proceeds to the extent of having either general or specialized law clinic where they actually integrate and go into the communities to solve the social problems of the communities, to actually deal with real life situations. Uh, so, and the skills that you actually require for clinical legal education are the basic skills you also need to develop as a lawyer. So you need to build your communication skills, your research, alternative dispute resolution, your writing and drafting skills, your interviewing skills, your listening skills, advocacy, analytical counseling, critical skills. There are so many skills that comes with exposure to clinical legal education, especially the street clinical aspect where you have clinics and you expose students to dealing with real life clients. Uh, so in Nigeria, of course, a lot of law faculties are seeing the benefit of clinical legal education in the performances of their students as a result of which a number of law faculties are embracing clinical legal education. But like I said, the challenge still remains what this connotes to each faculty of law that is adopting the approach. Um, yes, a lot of uh, law faculties already have specialized campus-based clinics. Some have um, general law clinics. And a good number of faculty already engage in street law where they try to educate members of the societies of the communities on particular uh, aspects or branches or areas of law. And they try to make them know their rights and where to go to if they have challenges. And a lot of law academics are willing to become clinicians in their respective fields. But 
there is still the challenge of the, the, the technical know-how, how to go about it, what to do, and that is still in terms of capacity building generally. And students are actually becoming more aware of the importance of uh, practical training, as opposed to the rules and theoretical training that had always been the norm in the legal profession in Nigeria. And then, yes, we still have an issue when it comes to ICT and legal training. Uh, there's a diverse opinion. Some believe, no, ICT cannot actually be employed in teaching law. And to some, the use of ICT is just about having PowerPoint that you project in class, and then you just like this student. Whereas ICT is so important in legal training in terms of data collection, analysis, software that you can use to analyze your data, and then to take your research beyond uh, doctrinal uh, method. And then when we look at the impact of COVID-19 on legal education in Nigeria, we realize at the peak of the lockdown, a lot of universities in Nigeria, especially the private universities, were able to transition into online teaching and assessment. So they were able to complete their, <clears throat> their uh, requirements, the curriculum online, and even assess their students online. But this was a major challenge for the law students. For those schools that were able to transition online to continue teaching and learning online, Assessing the students online became a challenge, as a result of which students just had to be on hold and they could not proceed into the next semester and start their classes compared to their counterparts who are not law students. They had to wait until the, the lockdown uh, restrictions were lifted and they had to converge in person to write their exam. And a lot of factors were responsible for this. There were institutional barriers, the fear of, oh, if we do this with uh, AUC or CME, withdraw our accreditation or our approval, because for law programs, they're not allowed to, to, to do any online learning or online assessment for quality assurance purposes. Then there's a perception of the inability to actually monitor effective examinations online. Some believe that no, it will be compromised and Whereas we refuse to look beyond that and understand that it is actually possible to give an applied questions. And even we have uh, a lot of places where people have to like do open book exams. You have all your resources, but the truth is you cannot cheat if you don't even know how to apply the law. But we did not take advantage of um, the ICT development and involvement during the COVID to actually tap into this in improving the ICT use of legal education in Nigeria. And unfortunately, we still have to go back to the physical. And we could not even, and uh, beyond COVID, we are still where we were in terms of legal education. Uh, so what are some of the challenges in legal education, especially in the development in Nigeria, remains funding. There's always a, a challenge of, with funding. And that goes beyond just uh, legal education. There's the organizational culture, the fact that the institutions regulating the, the profession are uh, too, and then you still have a lot of internal uh, institutional culture in each university. Then the fact that there's still lack of um, independence of the judiciary in Nigeria still takes its toll in the legal education itself. Um, we still have a lot of people saying, okay, even if we, do this, how does it translate into practice when you cannot even make decisions? There's, uh, there's that he who, who, who pays the, uh, who, what now, sorry, I'm a bit confused about that at it. That who, he who pays the five pounds dictates, dictates the thing, right? So there's still this um, societal perception that, oh, even the lawyers, the judges are compromised because they're still being controlled by the executive. So that's in a way as it affects on legal education in Nigeria. We still have a challenge with inefficient knowledge management. You see that there, there are so many things, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> like you have some people being trained as clinicians and the moment they leave the organization, probably because they've not stepped down the training or there's no tool, they don't have tools for data collection or for 
on the studying the activities of that person, that program stops and leads to that person. So we still have a challenge with knowledge management. Then the fact that the approach of clinical liberal education is still not uniform in Nigeria as it's so on, the, on liberal education. Then the importance attached to clinical liberal education varies, as I mentioned earlier. Then another problem is when you have the student clinicians doing such a good job, then the fact that they do not have the right to full or partial audience in court impedes their ability to actually uh, put their skills into full-fledged use or to even assess themselves on their abilities and their skills. Because when it gets to the point where they have to appear in court, then they have to pass it out to the staff clinician. Rather than having the right of partial audience in court, that will enable them to at least put the skills they've acquired in the course of uh, clinical education, legal education into practice. Then we still have a lot of challenges in, in terms of technical know-how, how the ICT skills that are actually required that goes beyond just PowerPoint and data entry. So the right, to, uh, okay, I already mentioned the right of audience. Sorry about the repetition. So in the light of this, we advocate for a reform in the curriculum of uh, liquid education in Nigeria to actually incorporate uh, clinical liberal education as a matter of necessity in such a way that there's a uniform approach and a benchmark, a minimum standard that is required. If you have to have a clinic that is compulsory and how to go, so it should be a kind of compulsory aspect, just like we have some compulsory courses. Then we also recommend that all law schools, all law faculties should have at least one clinic which could be specialized based on the needs of the communities, or it could be a general clinic. Then we recommend uh, the training, retraining, and continuous training of staff clinicians and more law lecturers. We should stop, uh, we, we shouldn't get, like presently now, it's all about Can you round interest. Up? So it should be, yes, I'll round up in the next two minutes. So it should go beyond just a matter of interest. It should also be a kind of integral part of the legal training. Then we should encourage blended approach to teaching and learning law, such that you can have some modules online and some in person. Uh, then we should also emphasize on the social, the, the importance of uh, social justice in terms of clinical legal education. And then, yeah, we should show positive attitude. And then effective knowledge management and continuous training on, on what is required and the importance of legal ethics in all our approaches. Thank you. Thank you, Olanike. Olanike is a faculty at the School of Law, American University of Nigeria, Yola. Thank you once again. Can we have uh, Dr. Erebi Idoni? Are you there, Dr. Erebi? Yes, I'm here. Very well, thank you. Dr. Erebi is an assistant uh, professor at the faculty at the School of Law, American University of Nigeria. She will be talking on effectiveness of continuing legal education in Nigeria, an investigation into the legal continuing professional program. Thank you, please, you have 15 minutes, you can start. Okay, thank you. Um, could you enable me to share my screen so that um, I can share my slides? I just tried and it says it's disabled. Okay. I made you a co-host. You should be able to share it. Okay, um, maybe um, you made my Arabian Doni a co-host. Could you make oh. Arabian? That's I'm actually me... logged in on two devices for backup as I complained about my network earlier on. Okay. Sorry about that. No problem. Let me.
Yes. Okay. All right, thank you very much. You're welcome. I believe you can see my screen now. Yes, we can see. Okay, um, once again, um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I also like to apologize for not being there physically. I also had some visa challenges. And if you would permit me um, for the duration of the presentation, I'll just um, put my video off so that my bandwidth would um, not be affected as I go on, if that's okay. You can go ahead. Okay. All right, so um, my topic is the effective, as the chair has said, the effectiveness of continuing legal education in Nigeria. Um, and I'm investigating um, the legal continuous professional development program. I'll be looking at um, some two jurisdictions, um, especially well one, and then see if I can, we can draw lessons from the other one. Um, I believe the importance of continuing legal education cannot be overemphasized. The public has a perception about lawyers that certain standards will be maintained, especially um, as most members of the public know the rigorous training that lawyers um, undergo in school, and then what it takes to pass the bar exams and all of that, they assume that that same standard will be maintained even as they begin to render services to um, the populace or citizens. So um, basically to define our terms, continuing legal education would be additional professional training and education that lawyers undergo after they've been admitted into um, to the bar or any education they obtain after graduation. And for lawyers specifically, we're talking about admission into the bar. Um, it's most times used interchangeably with the term continuing professional development. It's used synonymously in most cases. Um, in other situations, you find that it is based on the jurisdiction. So while some jurisdiction would prefer CLE, others would rather go with CPD. And CPD is also designed to increase or maintain the skills and competence of lawyers. So I'll just be looking briefly at what is obtainable in Nigeria. Now, um, first of all, the argument that we, uh, that we see when we look at um, CLE is the fact of the responsibility. Whose responsibility is it? Rule 11 of the Rules of Professional Conduct have attached this responsibility to the Nigerian Bar Association. However, um, Section 3 of the Legal Education Consolidation Act um, says that the Council of Legal Education ought to be responsible for anything which hitherto the Institute of Continuing Legal Education was responsible for. Now, if we want to go into the semantics of um, which supersedes which, we'll look at um, the case of University of Lagos and Igoro, and it sort of leads us to the point, or it tries to emphasize that the council should actually have that responsibility. However, we know that the NBA is the major stakeholder in legal education. Um, the president of the NBA is part of the council of, a member of the council of legal education. We also have some members of the NBA represented in the council as well. So that also gives the NBA the ground or the um, locus to carry on continuing legal education. Now, there is the impression that probably if we have the council, which is already used to um, the training of lawyers, it probably would be in a better form or in a more organized form. That notwithstanding, if we look at what it is today under the Nigerian Bar Association, we'll see that we have an Institute of Continuing Legal Education 
and there are mandatory continuing legal education rules. So the scope of the rules uh, or the, the rules actually provide for exemption of certain category of lawyers. Now, these are judicial officers. Um, the rules, or there is the presumption that they do have um, an institute that takes care of judicial officers. So there's, if they also are run by um, the institutes um, done by the MBA, then it will be a duplication of effort. Now, attorney generals of the states and the federation are also exempted. Lawyers on active duty in the armed forces, they are exempted until they conclude that active duty in the armed forces. And then um, once they are now um, subsumed into the system of practicing lawyers again, they would, um, be they would no longer be exempted. Now there's also the issue of temporary exemption or the extension of time of certain category of lawyers. Those lawyers have to show good cause while, why they are not able to um, undertake the CLE at the time they are supposed to. It could be as a result of illness. There could be financial hardship, which of course is a reality for a lot of lawyers, especially those that are young at the bar, or it could be for some extraordinary circumstance. However, the institute um, or the mandatory rules set out the scope of um, the, the kind of continuing legal education that is expected of lawyers. And it's really um, all encompassing because it gives you um, two categories. The first category talks about base, the basic skills course. And the second category um, talks of the minimum CLE requirement. Now, the beauty of the basic skill course is that it is expected that upon admission, every legal practitioner would go undergo at least 24 hours of trial advocacy, which you know, is, um, would equip the lawyer in terms of litigation, in terms of um, taking, um, um, in terms of leading expert witnesses, and all other things that you would need in the management of a firm. Now, the beauty of the Nigerian um, mandatory continuing legal education is that it also takes care of academics. Is that within 24 hours, before you actually start teaching, you should have a compulsory basic course requirement where you are taught things about course assessment, curriculum development, you know, things that would tailor the lawyer strictly to what is required in the legal profession. Now, once this um, basic skills requirement has been fulfilled, we have the minimum CLE requirement, which um, it has been apportioned as 30 hours within the reporting period of two years for every legal practitioner. Benches and civil, uh, senior advocates have their own requirements of 24 hours, and both should be a minimum of four hours in certain key subject areas, such as professionalism of a lawyer, legal ethics, and corrupt issues. We know that Nigeria has been dealing with a lot of issues as regarding corruption. So it is pertinent that in concluding C CLE, that the legal practitioners um, take a minimum of four hours in this um, particular areas. Now for accreditation standards, um, there are different standards that are acceptable. For instance, um, bar association meetings would classify as the fulfillment of CLE as teaching CLE courses um, as a facilitator would also qualify as that. Since the, the laws embrace academics, it also makes provision for legal scholarship, for pro bono training and things like that. So we could say that our regulations in Nigeria are beautiful in that regard, the number of hours in the consideration of those that have one form of financial um, hardship or the other, and in the incorporation of academics into the system such that they are not left out. However, the issue that we seem to have 
uh, procedure or the enforcement um, means. Now, after the completion of the CLE, as we, uh, the lawyer is supposed to submit the forms to the director of the ITLE, who would issue a certificate, and it has a 31 days deadline to do this. However, the rules fail to tell us what would be the penalty or what would be the outcome of the lack of completion of the CLE. It's stated that it is mandatory. If it is mandatory, if it is not completed or concluded, what then would be the penalty? It doesn't say that. Now we look at the United States of America and the system that is um, in operation there. So like Nigeria, we have the mandatory continuing legal education. Now we have minimum in bracket because some states refuse to um, adopt the nomenclature of mandatory. They believe that it ought to be a minimum requirement rather than mandatory. But whatever it is, um, it is in operation in every state. Now, initially, um, continuous legal education started as um, a, an act that was voluntary, especially after the war, and a lot of attorneys were about to be reintegrated into the system. The mandatory bit or the minimum bit was actually um, kicked off in 1975. And it states 15 hours per reporting year, which is akin or similar to what we have in Nigeria. Nigeria says 30 hours for each two year reporting period. Now, the, in, the good thing about um, the American system is that the membership, membership of the American Because uh, the moment you can pay your badges, which a lot of lawyers do, then you have access to CLEs. Now, it also um, the different states also give a different reporting timeline um, from state to state, so these vary. And the different states also, based on their jurisdiction, highlight certain laws that they want emphasis to be placed on. Now, the beauty about this system is the repercussion for non-compliance, which um, could range from um, not being active from practice. Now, I believe that this would obviously keep attorneys on their toes, or it would make it, um, it would, you know, encourage them to ensure that the CLE has, are completed. Now, no man is an island, and we believe that the law is evolving. If it's evolving, it means we need to be up to date with what is going on around the world. So, for instance, uh, my colleague talked about what um, happened during COVID. During COVID, most lawyers were not even used to things like webinars, which are basic ICT skills which everyone ought to have. Now, if there's a program on CLE regarding ICT skills, of course, you see that lawyers would quickly jump on it and such and develop their knowledge or their skills in that particular area. Now, I, am, I also looked at um, the jurisdiction of the United Kingdom. They started out like the United States, making CLE mandatory and giving the option or having a lineup of courses which lawyers were to pick from. They discovered along the lines that it was getting monotonous. This mandatory aspect, duty that ought to be fulfilled rather than something which the benefits can be garnered from or can be taken from. And so they gave an option of each firm trying to find out the needs of the lawyers in that firm and then CLERs can be credited when they're mentoring members of the firm. So if you're a senior in a firm, you spend time mentoring and then it will be credited as CLERs, which I believe that we can learn from in Nigeria. So as I highlighted earlier, 
uh, the uh, CLE program in Nigeria, as stated by the Institute, is beautiful. It um, makes provision for different categories of lawyers in the system. However, the challenge would be if it is not um, actually enforced in terms of the penalties that would be meted to the lawyers. Also, if we can provide a, a solution to the issue of financial hardship, such that once you pay your bad dues, you would have access to certain materials that would qualify as CLE as, then we can take care of the um, partial exemption or the temporary exemption under which financial hardship um, falls under. I think um, I'm, I'm almost done in my time. Maybe I have like one minute left. But you have two minutes me. left. Okay. You have two um, minutes um, left. I'm through, Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank you so much. So um, that is the presentation. It's an ongoing research. So of course, I would um, welcome feedback as much as I can get. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ereni. Thank you. The presentation is very, very insightful because of my own, I learned that even if you are in academics, before you start teaching, you must have a, a mandatory continuing legal education, which myself as a, a law teacher, I do not even have that knowledge before I even started teaching. So it's a very good one. Thank you once again. The last uh, presentation will be on the impact of Nigerian legal education on justice dispensation. And this will be delivered by Dr. Michael Adeleke. Dr. Michael Adeleke is an associate professor at the Obafemi Awolowo University, Ileife. Thank you, sir. You can start. You have 15 minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, um, the audience. Um, like the chair said, um, my paper is uh, basically on the impact of uh, the Nigerian legal education on justice dispensation in Nigeria. And um, I will go straight to the meat of the paper um, so that there will not be you know, a lot of research by our past presenters about, um, you know, some goes to the structure and a lot of other areas, which I will probably not even talk about now because it has actually been you know, talked about. But I, I, I will try as much as possible to go into the meat of the paper. Now, um, the problem of justice dispensation, uh, which most often has been blamed on judges, uh, we tend to believe that because of the workload of judges and a lot of other things that, uh, you know, several adjournments, he set up adjournments and all that has always been, uh, you know, the problems of the judges. Well, that, I mean, we, we must understand the fact that before we have, it is also the, the lawyers that becomes, you know, judges. Now, the question that needs to be answered this afternoon is that, does the method, standard and the quality of legal education, does it have a role to play in justice dispensation or justice delivery in Nigeria? And that is the question that we need to address. Now, the, a, a former chairman of uh, the Nigeria Council of Legal Education once uh, opined, Justice Manager of Blessed Memory, and this is what he said. He said, legal education, as well as, book, I mean, academic and vocational now, which the academic, the university, the vocational from the Nigeria Law School, is a vital ingredient that affects the quality of our justice system and the role of lawyers in the political, economic, and social development of our country. Now, the quality of the judicial decisions and the coherence of the reasoning underlying judgment depends upon the quality of argument presented to the court and upon the ability of the judge. All of this depends on the quality of our legal education. There is no gain saying that over a period of time, we have a lot of challenges with, you know, uh, our justice dispensation and this 
we can narrow down the kind of you know um, the kind of education that we also have. Now, a lot of factors or a lot of factors, you know, have been discussed. I mean, a lot of issues have arisen as to the fact that what are the issues that affect, you know, uh, the quality of education itself, the legal education itself, so that once you address the problem of the, 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 the quality of legal education, then just delivery or just information we easily uh, you know be taken care of now low funding has been you know talked about outdated curricula has been talked about weak enrollment in continuing legal education has been talked about a lot of people have, I mean we have several people have spoken about it you know here about you know uh, the continuing legal education and all that and all that now, one thing we must know right from the board goal is that a lawyer can only be as good as the system of education that was that produced it. You can never, once you are not, you know, you are not baked uh, very well. Imagine a scenario when you put a pan and you put the, the cake inside, and then inside the pan. It's kind of there's a crooked, it's kind of crooked or something. It's not straightened. Of course, once you remove the cake, it's likely to be have a dent. So that is exactly the you know the scenario that we are really that is confronting us. So the quality of legal education is inextricably linked with the quality of justice dispensation in Nigeria. Now let us look at the structure of legal education in Nigeria. Like I said, a lot has been said about the structure and all that, you know, uh, which, you know, the Council of Legal Education, apart from when, when, it, when you enter the university as a law student, uh, in times past, before the introduction of the, uh, the five-year system, it was four years, you know, you do 12 courses, and you go to the law school and then come out. Now, the course unit system was introduced, making it five years. So it means you go to the, the, the university, you'll be there for five years, and then you go for, to the Nigerian law school for nine months, and then you are called to the Nigerian bar. Now, the well, uh, the, the law faculties that were established in Nigeria at that period were, were, were all there, but like I said, I'm going to now kind of uh, scale through all these ones. Now, we also have situations where we have foreign trained law graduates that are also educated, I mean, educated in common law jurisdiction, are also eligible for admission into the Nigerian law school, uh, provided that they have completed the required course content of that foreign university. So, in, in other words, to ensure uniformity in curriculum content taught at the law faculties, the Council of Legal Education and the Nigerian Universities Commission approve the curriculum that are taught to law students across the leg and breadth of Nigeria. So, it is only after the law student has completed the approved course of study at the undergraduate level, at least with a pass that is eligible to be admitted to the, for the vocational training in the Nigerian law school. And then it goes there nine months, you know, it's out. Now, the training offer to the Nigerian law student at the Nigerian law school is quite distinct from the law program at the undergraduate level. It is mostly procedural as opposed to the substantive law we teach them at the university. Now, following after the are after the, 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 the law student or the lawyer is admitted. You know, to the Nigerian bar by the body of ventures when they are, they are certain to be fit and proper. Now, I've outlined all this so that we look at it that, oh, look, is this system of legal education that you have just described? Can we say it has, you know, prepared, you know, the, the lawyers that we produce in our country for this, for, for you know, real legal practice, the 21st legal practice? 21st century legal practice. Can the law students produced through this system 
foster a robust system of justice dispensation in present day Nigeria. Now, while the structure of legal education is not in itself inherently defective, the manner in which the legal education under the existing structure has been delivered has been beset with a lot of challenges which have, been comprom which have compromised the quality of legal education in Nigeria. Now let us look at these defects in our legal, legal education. Now, the challenges or the defects that we that has you know compromised the, the legal education or the discharge of the legal education in our country as of today are the few things I want to quickly discuss about so that I mean before brand, I mean before giving the um, uh, the solutions. Now the very first one which has been highlighted which has been noted is the absence of actual clinical education in law school and the method of teaching. Now, even right from the undergraduates, from the university, the method of teaching has been quite outdated over a period of time. Now, we, it's like, you know, when, when, you, when you teach, when medical doctors are trained, they are trained, you know, particularly the ones that are going to surgery and all that and all that, you know, you treat them with life, you know, uh, they call them uh, cadavers, you know, you take them to the, you know, to their whatever, and they, they see it life. Now, the kind of training we give to our law students or who are, I mean, who are going to be lawyers, ultimately, now, does it allow them to actually have the best clinical training, you know, in, so that it, it, it that we help them in discharging, you know, the functions, you know, of their of, of this uh, trade. I mean, of this work that they are going to face. Cleaner education must go beyond teaching with books, which we all do, and trial advocacy must be learned, learned right from the university. Now there are special skills of advocacy which uh, we have been trying to, you know, inculcate in our students. But I, I think for a very long time now, for some time now, uh, we have not really done enough. So the medical profession does not try to teach surgery simply by simply with books. More than 80% of medical teaching is done by practicing physicians and surgeons. So I think the uh, law profession or the uh, we also must borrow a leaf from this so that we can you know, improve the quality of legal education we give to our uh, students. Now, we also have the problem of inadequate facilities for functional legal education. Now, there's a need for general faculties of law to conform to the ever-increasing standard of legal practice. Uh, during our own time, uh, not too long ago, 27, 28 years ago, the law faculties across the length and breadth of Nigeria can just be counted. The, you know, the University of OAU, Ibadan, Amadou Bello, um, and, you know, the first generation universities and probably some few second generation universities. Over a period of time, we have, you know, law faculties springing forth, you know, from even private universities and all that. During my own time at the Nigerian Law School, it was just the Nigerian Law School in Lagos that was in existence. The enrollment at the Nigerian Law School at that period was about 1,500 that were churned out, even during my sex, from across the length and breadth of Nigeria. Now we have about six or seven law faculties. And at any point in time, you have 5,000, 6,000, you know, law graduates that have been churned out, you know, every call to at every call to bar. So there is a need for. The, you see the, the, the law faculties to actually conform because the, the enrollment figure is quite alarming now. So the process of you know, delivery and the process of training has to really change to cope with you know, the, the, the large numbers of uh, you know, uh, students that are coming out of uh, the universities. Then lack of adequate funding is also one of the problems. 
uh, that is also besetting the training of uh, lawyers. Generally speaking, education in Nigeria remains grossly underfunded. It is not only law and it's not only the education alone. Generally, uh, Nigeria has the Nigerian government has always paid leave service to education. Uh, federal budgetary allocation to set uh, to that, that is recommended by UNESCO is about you know is is very very low. The impact of such budgetary allocation of education is also actively felt by legal education. Vanguard News against UNESCO's recommendation and Nigeria budgets only 3.6 trillion per education, per, you know, for education in about six years. So, which is quite very, very low. So, there is just, I mean, the Nigeria must uh, wake up to the fact that, you know, it must budget, you know, uh, there has to be adequate budget for education and more importantly, legal education, you know. So the so that, that, that is just so, also one of the problems that is uh, you know. Then another problem that we also look at is the outdated law curriculum. And in this uh, conference, even this conference, we we'll talk about you know the curriculum that are being you know that are being used to teach our law students you know. It's most of them are quite outdated, and there's a need. I remember the, I think the, the panel before this one or the panel, yeah, talked about dealt seriously about this uh, outdated curriculum. You know, so a current because you look at the current law curriculum is being used in some universities. We read that the curricula are not up to date, and lag behind that we, down which is obtainable in leading jurisdictions around the world. Aside the traditional foundational legal topics, elective courses that reflect contemporary legal realities are hardly taught in many Nigerian law faculties. For instance, the average number of course offerings in Nigerian law faculty are like 40. This is in sharp contrast to the United States where the average number of law course offerings in senior classes is an average of law, 84. So uh, though the Council of Legal Education has imposed the list of core courses, which the law faculties must offer, it is intended to serve as a minimum guideline on the government legal curriculum. The truth, however, is that most universities simply adopt the regimes, this regime of courses as their maximum and not the minimum, with few faculties, you know, including, I mean, just scant law electives. Uh, I remember when Dr. Uh, uh, I mean, Dr. Oluwada I see was here in the afternoon. Uh, we talked about mentoring and all those stuff. And you know, and we actually was talking thinking about even that could be formalized as a way of uh, you know uh, improving the curricula that have been you know taught uh, uh, I mean our students. Now the legal education curriculum is strictly taught via a theoretical approach with emphasis on high achievements in standardized tests and examinations and indicator for higher performance. What something that's something that actually baffles me over a period of time now, which is quite surprising, is that we have large numbers of first class students coming out of our universities, coming out of Nigerian law schools of few years ago with Nigerian law school produced, produced about uh, 140 something, you know, students in the in the first class category. I haven't seen that reflection, you know, in the quality of legal practice. Sometimes you go to the to our courts and you 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 see uh, some of our students who have come up with their first class, you know, second class offer, you know, and then making some serious somersaults. Even before our judges, some of them could not even, you know, differentiate between what is uh, what what is a prohibition or, or what is a sugarai or even a mandamus, and you know, so and these are some of these students that will automatically be appointed as magistrates, and some of them, you know, move on to the higher bench to become judges. 
Now, so in, in, in effect, what, what exactly do we expect this kind of, uh, you know, students who have uh, metamorphosed into magistrates and maybe ultimately go to the higher bench? What exactly would you expect from them? Because, you know, to, I mean, you, you don't, you can't give up, give something you don't have. So that's it's quite a, uh, so I, I think the problem also has to do with the way and manner we try to, I mean, we train them. So the curricula has to be reviewed. So as to enable our students to be up to date with current trends, it will be appropriate to say that the world changes and, and for one not to be left behind, one should keep in touch with the current legal trends. Legal education should not be an, an exception. Now, weak enrollment, on continuing legal education programs by Nigerian lawyers. I think we also talked about this at some point. Now, this continuing legal education, sometimes the Nigerian Bar Association calls it mandatory legal education. There's nothing mandatory about this legal education because there are no sanctions. Now, it is expected that a lawyer, maybe about five years at the bar, I mean, one, between one year to five years at the bar, should continually update himself you know, by this uh, continued education programs instituted by or the mandatory legal, uh, mandatory, uh, you know, programs instituted by the Nigerian Bar Association, but they, they hardly go there, you know. So, and there is a saying that says, anybody who starts learning is old, whether 20 or 80, anyone who keeps learning stays young. So when you don't, when you stop learning, you begin to grow. So the greatest thing in life is to keep your mind young. So there's the need to make that this mandatory continuing education has to be mandatory, and there must be sanctions. So uh, I think these are some of the. So there's this the the, the continuing legal education has to be improved so that and make it mandatory for you know our lawyers or young lawyers so that we can. So, because why do you say it's mandatory when we don't mean when we don't mean it so? So we are simply pay for conference and never show up. They will go there, they won't show up, and there are no sanctions. So the Nigeria Association, the Nigeria Bar Association has to really, you know, uh, work hard and make sure that this thing is quite mandatory for them. Now, going now quickly now, how do these pitfalls impact on justice administration in Nigeria? I've highlighted the problems. Now, now do they affect justice uh, uh, dispensation? The low quality of legal education in Nigeria impacts justice administration in Nigeria in three ways. One, as far as legal education in Nigeria is concerned, it remains a pipeline through which lawyers are mined, and indeed through which future judicial officers are supplied. And if there is some sort of, you know, uh, decay, or you know, if there's a sort of a problem in mining those lawyers, of course. That it, 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 it goes without saying that such lawyers that are mined, we go, you know, out and, uh, you know, get, uh, we're not, we're not can, performing well. Can you round up, sir? Several, yes, uh, two minutes. Now, we also have several poor trained legal practitioners that have infiltrated legal practice. We have a lot of charlatans in legal practice cases. People who are not supposed to be in practice, they are there. You know, some are there to please their parents and all that. And, you know, yeah, some of them are just not uh, so um, now uh, let me conclude. Or oh, sorry, let me go to the core recommendations. Cleaner training, a return of pupillage. A lot of lawyers don't like pupillage. They want to get into practice and then blue just at once. They go, a lot of lawyers are now into, you know, selling houses and all that. And nothing, there's nothing bad about it for them. Pupillage, increment in like education allocation is part of the recommendations that we need to do. Uh, review of legal education curriculum, standard of quali quality control, you know, remuneration and promotion of law teachers, mandatory continuing legal education are part of the recommendations and all that. And lastly, I don't know how this one will tell us. I think we should return back to the old system of training our lawyers. The decay setting, in my opinion, when we introduce this course unit system. Look at the um, the pharmacy and that of the medical profession, they still maintain the strict you know, 
the, ex the exam is just once and all that. And you know, it's, there's a lot of sanity in the system. So I still want to advocate for that as we come to back with the system. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Michael Adelike, for that uh, presentation. So, do you have any uh, comments or observations or anything that an input to the presentation, or you have questions? Thank you, ma. Comments and questions. Okay. okay.
in the United States, trying to be in Nigeria. So many of them like that that I know graduated in Nigeria. We have professors of law all over the world that had their first degree in Nigeria. So why should we make presentations that from the beginning to the end will be there will be no sellable point? We are just lucky that here we have, I don't know if there are uh, participants from other countries online. Yes, somebody just are, joined. Uh, okay, I can see a lady of them. So if we listen to other uh, participants all over the world, there are dark spots in education and in legal education everywhere, everywhere, even in the US, everywhere. So please, when we are making presentations, let us be fair to us. It's not all negative. Let us bring out a technical point. Okay. Then, Olani um, uh, started with a uh, in this year, she mentioned lack of independence of the judiciary. I don't know what example she had in mind that made her believe that there's no independence of the judiciary in Nigeria. Then to Eric, um, that the list she showed on the slide, where she mentioned prevention. Talk about uh, judicial officers and what we interest the federal level. Exemption to what? So I need to know okay. the macro they believe they are what? Some people think that they are the macro. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You're welcome. If I got uh, Dr. Arabi well, I think the ex ex exception mentions are those that are exempted from having a continuous uh, mandatory legal education. But she's still online. Dr. Arabi? Still online. Um, good evening, ma'am. Um, am I correct? Am I correct that uh, the exceptions are mentioned in your slide are those that are not uh, mandated to have continuous yes, legal uh, education? Yes, actually, the exemption for judicial officers is that they are exempted from C compulsory CLE under. Um, uh, uh, the ICLE because they have an institute um, that covers their own continuous professional development. So they are not subjected to what we have under the ICLE from the rules. That's, um, Thank you. I would think that that would be a bit misleading in the sense that there is a national judiciary so maybe in future presentations to add that there is what is known as a national judicial institution where judges are trained, magistrates too, even registrars are trained there uh, every quarter. There are different subjects every quarter. Because yeah, it's, I, it, it, I it, talked it, through it in the slides. I didn't dwell on it um, because of the time factor, but it's represented in the paper the full um, paper. Okay, thank you. Yes. And then um, I also pointed out um, laudable aspects of the CLE program, especially the fact that it um, does incorporate um, skills for law teachers, which you do not find in most um, other jurisdictions. So there were also um, I think the presentation had a lot of sellable points for our CLE program. The only disadvantage I pointed out was the lack of penalty um, when it is not done or when it is not concluded. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I saw you raised your hand. Olanike, are you there? Yeah. Yes, I'm still online. Uh, okay. Thank you, your worship. Um, we no, really appreciate your contribution and just like um, Alanike. Alanike oh, thank you, my lord. My yes, lord is a <laughs> oh, I'm really sorry about that, my lord. Thank you, my lord. Um, we really appreciate your contribution, and like uh, Dr. Rebin Donny said, I also pointed out the strengths of clinical legal education and the positive impact on the legal education in Nigeria. Uh, so in the paper, I tried to uh, look at the perception of 
the public on the quality of legal education when they try to link it to the, the, the result in terms of access to justice and the judiciary. So to a layman, they don't really see a difference in legal education and the judiciary, they believe all oh, lawyers, lawyers, and lawyers are even judges, of which there is a link. So what I try to do in the paper is to try and connect, and this is uh, because it's a kind of mixed research. So I interviewed some judges, and it was found that a major impediment in terms of access to justice in some cases, especially in political, case, their political cases, is a direct influence from the executives. So that is the linkage I try to provide in terms of the independence of the judiciary. Okay. Thank you, Melo. You're welcome. Yes, Doctor. Thank you for the recognition. I like to uh, celebrate all the paper presenter. Um, I can see a lot of link between um, almost all the three papers. Yeah, actually, education. Education and continuous uh, education. My first concern has always been that, uh, given that the ROPC, uh, new provision for continuous legal education, and the conflicting uh, responsibility of who should be in charge uh, of continuous legal education. The concern has, for me has always been that um, those who are organizing or in charge of it, are they actually competent or qualified to do it? I'm looking at the challenges personally that I've faced um, in this continuous legal education. Let's say, for example, recently I was asking the leadership of the NDA, uh, different sessions in charge of continuous legal education, I'm talking about, because we must define continuous legal education in this sense. It's not about university education. It's not about law school education. No. It's about educating we that are already lawyers for improvement. So it has nothing to do with law school or university. It's like a kind of an advanced professional training course that we ought to do. So now, those who are in charge, there was a session that did continuous legal education, and lawyers were to pay. Another session, maybe on business, it was free. Another one I attended on tax, it was online. Others, physical appearance. And Right now, MBA is permitting certain individual or private entities coming up with courses and asking of lawyers to subscribe to it. Exactly. And then they, they assign it as one of the continuous legal education assessment. So the question is how the, the, the competency of those people, it means that I can come up tomorrow and say, okay, I'm an expert in technology. A MBA, give me approval, lawyers come and do it. It's part of your continuous legal education. So, do we have an institute established that will be in charge? And if there is an institute, is that institute actually doing the work? Because now, certain private entities are taking over. In the course of MBA conference, I'm sure MBA conference is still on now in Lagos, mm -hmm. you will also discover that in the various sessions, you have some online courses you are asked to subscribe to why the conference is going on. And the entities in charge of those trainings, the people organizing the training for the lawyers, some of them, I mean, they are not, they don't have anything to do with the MBA, but they don't get the sanction. I mean, let me say, to get the um, approval of the MBA to go and run those courses. Some will just come and say, uh, we, have, we have been accredited to train on uh, forensic uh, stuff. Lawyers come and do. So um, there should be more organization in, in that, which I, I see as a, a challenge. Then another thing that is still not addressed, which I also 
found in the law that is section 11 and 12 of that uh, section. Um, with respect to uh, sanction, I think if we check section uh, rule 12, there's something that says that if you have not done the professional uh, um, course with the certificate, you will not, it's, a, it's like a qualification for you to practice that very year. Um, I can't, I, I don't know, I can't be specific now, but I know still, rule 12 says something about that. In a way to compel us to do it. Although there is no sanction in the way of the enforcement, yeah. but there's something that wants us to do it uh, at all the time. But the question uh, I want to also um, want the, you to address there is the number of hours for the courses that ought to be done are graduated. Uh, the, 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 the longer the longer the longer the oh. hours that you have to do, and then if there is no advocate, you you don't have to just do some and then and then go. So, but with the current trends and development, sincerely, if we have to be frank with ourselves, I will tell you that there are things that are now new which even senior lawyers are yet to be acquitted to, but already known to the young lawyers. Exactly. Issue of ICT, issue of sport law, entertainment, financial technology. And I have found out too, that in some of our friends, the younger lawyers are always the one doing the work of the senior advocates of the jail. So if, if, if for me, I want to suggest, like the presenter in the other session said, that in UK now, they are going shifting to self-assessment. Assess yourself. If you know for this year, you need 12 hours. Even if you are Queen's Council, go and do 12 hours. If you know for the last five years, like my love is here, you may have some judges who are little two judges. You may not even step out, maybe just only Ghana and Malawi here. Okay. They probably have not been to other countries, other continents of the world, and uh, they just feel like they will be promoted. But some are struggling to add value to themselves. So for me, I think self-assessment will be best than just a regimented uh, tenure. You know, somebody who is 10 years has not done anything or has been to far. Okay. There are lawyers who just graduate and they don't go to entertainment. There are uh, uh, music and uh, movie makers. Uh, Nollywood people are just, they are getting into court now. And when they finish, they go back to Nollywood. And for seven years, nothing. But at the end of 10 years, they have a friend that is now actually the uh, governor. Yes, Ola Nike. So these are my concerns. Sorry for taking this. Okay. Yes, you can. Yes, uh, quickly, Sma. Let me respond to my lord. Um, it's not all good. I agree with you, it's not all good. But the papers are designed in such a way to look at the pitfalls and then look for areas of improvement. Uh, it's, it's not as if all of you, I agree with you on that. And then second is my, um, I did say here that why it is easier to blame judges that they are the one responsible for, you know, uh, you know the, 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 the day justice in Nigeria. The incessant judgments are at the instance are the instance of the legal partitioners. It's in my paper here. I, I didn't blame the judges. Yeah, judges. I mean, it is the lawyers that come to the to, to the. I mean, the, our judges are always ready to work. I have appeared several reports, many of them, and but it is law will the lawyer that will bring this one. Okay, so I did not blame the judges for judgments. I did not. How that the justice dispensation is at the feet of the judges. No. I'm actually blaming it on the legal practitioners. Mm -hmm. And the link I'm trying to create, link, is that a poorly trained lawyer, a poorly trained lawyer will definitely, the, 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 the way it's trained will definitely have an impact on justice dispensation. That's all. That's the link I'm trying to create. That. So we must train our lawyers very well so that, in, I mean, they will because it's a lot of some of them that will graduate with judges. 
Sometimes, I mean, you know, you we show. appear, we appear you before magistrates. Be, you have to be a lawyer before you before, become exactly. definitely. Yes, we appear before some of these magistrates, and some of them will not know all this and everything. They will get annoyed and start throwing rubbish at you. So that's just it. So it's not all good, man. It's all, we are all products of this uh, system. But you must agree with me, man, that during the time of your training, man, I, I mean, they are not the same thing as now. We have just one league, one law school during that period. How many lawyers have been, been turned out at that? You can, yeah, it's mad. maybe during your set, maybe you are no more than 500 at Nigerian law school. Now we have about 6,000, sometimes 8,000, sometimes 10,000, I mean, 10,000, you know, graduates. So the, 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 they are not even well accommodated. There are so many things that I've not even mentioned in this paper that I just, I just kept silent on this. So it's not all group, Mark. It's not all group. But we're just looking for rooms of improvement. That's Thank one. you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Olanike. Uh, thank you so much, um, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I just want to react to the uh, the question from uh, contribution. Uh, it's the, the truth of the matter is we have a very good institutional framework for uh, mandatory continuous um, legal education of lawyers. I think the major challenge we have is in the aspect of implementation and uh, monitoring. And the reason why I said this is this, uh, the MBA has a structure for continuous legal education. So I don't think having to set up, um, or oh, sorry, I don't think setting up an institution to be solely responsible for that is the solution. Rather, we should look at a mechanism where what we have can be made to be more effective. For instance, now we have a lot of programs uh, uh, springing up and being um, promoted, all in the name of mandatory uh, continuous legal education. And the truth is we have some people that are even 30 years at the bar that have never gone for uh, a single one of those training. So, the thing we should be looking at is, is there a mechanism to ensure that you meet up with the number of credits that you're supposed to take in a year? So I think that is a major challenge. If for adventure, you have to have a proof of your mandatory legal education or uh, continue, continuous legal education before you're able to pay for your next uh, practicing fee then that would be a, a very good way to ensure that people meet up with their credits. So when anybody comes up to say, okay, I want to propose a training in ICT and law, then they have to go through the, the, the appropriate department uh, of the MBA that is responsible for continuous legal education to see the relevance of that model and to allocate the number of credits to it, such that lawyers that take that can always transfer their credits to towards their credits for the year. And they will have proof, they will have certificate, and the credits will be, there will be a central database. And that is where ICT still comes in. So that you can always transfer your credit according to the credit that has been approved by the appropriate section of the MBA that comes towards your continuous, no, your continuous legal education. So I don't think setting up a new institution or body is the solution. Rather, we should focus on making what we have more effective. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Olanike. My own observe, or my own question goes to Dr. Adeleke. Yes. In your presentation, you talk about absence of actual clinical legal education in law school and method of teaching. In the course of the presentation, I actually agree with you that there is no actual clinical education. And from your perspective, that uh Clinical legal education is derived from the word clinical, that there's actual uh, live matters that are treated by the medical yes, doctors. Are different from, from theoretical, what theoretical book, book format that yeah. we are all used to. My own uh, question now is, how do we draw a line with this uh, aiding unauthorized practice of law if we allow our students to have a live matter like the medical doctors? Can you come again, please? You know, you under the hard PC, line. yes. Okay. Under the hard PC, okay. it is an offense, for, rule two, it okay. is an offense for uh, a non-lawyer, for a lawyer to hate uh, 
non-lawyer. It would be an uh, aiding non-authorized practice of law. Okay. So to my mind, I'm thinking if we say our students should be involved in life matter, yeah. that means they have they will be totally involved in taking up cases like the medical, the explanation of medical uh, practitioners that they can uh, go to the hospital, they will dissect, do this as clinical uh, the thing. Won't it amount to aiding unauthorized practice of law? I, I, I actually don't think so. We, we may, there, there should actually be a way of blending it. Yeah, in such a way that uh, it will not offend against the rule. Really, what, what I meant at that period, in that area is that, now, you know, even at the, at the university, we try as much as possible to bring to, to them, uh, maybe poorly now, we are not doing it well. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but we have this room from five o'clock. Oh, so that's we, great. We need to prepare for the um, okay. okay because we have two, two persons from online from Tokyo. Oh, to well, we thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Sure. Yes. I think this discussion we go on after uh, the discussion, the question I had may go on after this session. Yes. So thank you so much for joining online and we have come to the conclusion of this session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, everybody. Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Well done for your journey. Thank you, Master. Oh, so you know we started late, so I'm trying to meet up with it like, with the time. Uh, え、片山顔が見えないから。これで入れ、入れ先生大丈夫ですね。はい、ありがとうございます。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとう。
それにどちらでもどちらでもどちらも先生があのご自身でお入りになるなら全然それでもあじゃあこれで共有した方がいいですよねでマイクこれ使えばいいですよねマイクはこここれです,、うんですねはい、じゃあ先生そこで私の話するときはじゃあのここにはい立、はい、てていただいてどこから先生がこれでここでいらっしゃったらいいんじゃないですか先生じゃあ私ここで報告者にリバーさんが二個で悪いからじゃあ先生これこれ見ないけどそっちの第三もこちらに持ってきていただいてリバーさんここにああわかりましたわかりました。そうですよね、多分カメラ来ると思うんですけど。あの、田村さん、僕の部分をお願いしてよろしいですかあ私は持ってます。ありがとうございます。あ、それで。あ、それで。あ、それで。あ、それで。あ、それで。あ、それで。あ、それで。あ、それで。あ、それで。あ、それで。あ、それで。あ、それで。ですね。まあでもそうですね。オンラインで入れるものがワンスポット、ワンセッションに一日スポットしかないから、ね、オンライン参加の方はそうなるかも先生のご報告が最後でしたよね、森谷先生。そうです、ね。あの、確かに、で先生、ご退室ぴったり10時半でないといけないはずなので。あれでしたら、あれですよね。はい、ししししうん、なのでなあ、やっぱり、あの、皆さんで時間をしっかりキープすればという気は。もう短めにします、私。あのはい、全然短くて、ね、これを。<笑>すいませんそちらにいらっしゃるのは森際先生、石田先生、田村先生。はい、あとルーバン先生が今お越しになります。はい、あとあのオーディエンスの方がパラパラとパラぐらいですけど、はい。これ最後のセッションですね、今日。そうなんです。そうなんですこれすご,すごい盛りだくさんなプログラムだから、皆さん。あのです。<笑>そろそろ疲れて皆さん、何かこう。え皆さん、他のセッションにも出られたんですか私たちははい、順番にそうですか。あ、それはよかった。私はもうあのあれ？ありましたね。よろしいですか？ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、あ問すみません、会場ではどうかわからないんですが、森際先生の今のお声があん小さくしか聞こえなかったですね。そうですか。あ、これ大丈夫ですね。これで大丈夫。大丈夫。同じ人の声の方が通るから。Um, I was under the impression that I'm giving my talk in English without a simultaneous translation or without a translation. Is that right? Everything will be done in English, but this is not, not, not okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs>
So the test will be no Japanese. で先生はあの何時きっかりにお題にならないといけないんでしたっけ？十時半ぴったりですね。このセッションの終わる時間ですか？あ、そうなんです。セッションがあの本当はもうちょっと余裕を持ったんですが、どんどんずれどんどんずれてきて、はい、十、はい、時半には出なきゃいけないもんですから。申し訳ございません。すいません。でも報告お忙しいところありがとうございます。コンパクトに報告をします。Okay,、um, since it's already past five,、uh, although we don't have a full audience yet,、uh, <laughs> I think we'd like to begin.、Uh, hi, I'm, I'm、uh, Tomo Morigiwa, a chair for this session.、Um, this session is a sort of a summarization of i l e s 2 2 i l e s 2 2 is International Legal Ethics、uh, Symposium in Tokyo.、Uh, 2022. And this year, we had the pleasure of having the <clears throat> past、um, Chief Justice of the Canadian Supreme Court,、uh, Justice McLaughlin, come and give us her talk. And it gave us a way of understanding the justification of client、uh, lawyer privilege、um, in such a way that it would be <clears throat> applicable to the reality of Japan. So,、uh, <clears throat> Before I, 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 I have the, the speakers give their talk, let me give you a background of what's exactly at ISU、uh, in Japan.、Okay. Um, first of all, Japan is a、uh, civil law country.、Uh, and being a civil law country, it means that there is、uh, no、uh, institution of discovery. So, for、uh, private law cases,、um, the, each party uh, uh, presents only evidence that、uh, is in their favor. And, and that's it.、Uh, and therefore, there's really no need for protection of communication between the lawyer and the client because it's already there.、Um, the, where problems begin is when the Same way of thinking about the legal system is applied、um, to the、um, criminal and administrative <clears throat> field. Here, because there is no、uh, client lawyer privilege, the、uh, administrative authorities can come in and take away evidence that the lawyer has co painstakingly collected from the client. Uh, and use it for、uh, administrative purposes,、uh, usually to the detriment of the,、uh, the, the, the firm or the client at, at hand.、Um, and this is detrimental to、um, voluntary, uh, uh, voluntary cleaning of the house, as it were, of the firms.、Uh, when it, It、uh, establishes third party committees to find out、uh, problems about、uh, the, involving the firm.、Um, just when the third party commission, usually headed by experienced lawyers, collects the necessary information, the administrative authorities step in and take away all the evidence that was collected. And that's totally legal because there is no protection of client lawyer privilege. Uh, in Japan. And the reason that it, there is, isn't there, as I said, is because most cases in Japan are like everywhere else, private law cases. And in private law, there's really no need for this protection because、um, each side can present only the, you know, the, because there is no discovery, each side can present whatever it likes and usually to their own client's favor. That's it. So,、um, In order to protect the people, especially in the,、uh, the criminal process,、uh, but, but also the firms in the administrative process trying to clean itself up,、um, the Japan Federation of Bar Associations、uh, took the initiative of trying to introduce a system 
hold um, client loyal privilege to Japan so that the client can be protected. Now, um, were, were the administrative uh, authorities happy about this? Uh, obviously not. And, and therefore, uh, the Federation made very little headway. Um, and the study group, the research group that uh, we uh, have organized in Tokyo, meeting regularly, monthly, um, <coughs> has been trying to have been trying it has been trying to to do something about the issue um, for some years now, three to be exact. Um, but uh, uh, last year, um, we came upon an idea that just might work. And that is the strategy of having the, the, the privilege justified in terms of constitutional law, in terms of fundamental rights, human rights. And uh, as long as the Japanese governmental authorities claim that they are a civilized country uh, with liberty and democracy, very difficult to deny fundamental rights to the client. So, um, uh, what we did was to try to learn from Canada. <clears throat> we two choices, EU or Canada. Both have recently um, made this an institution. Now, when we looked at Canada, something very interesting uh, came to, to, to our knowledge. And that is, um, unlike the United States, uh, most other common law countries the, the principle of parliament, parliamentary supremacy still holds. So, so judicial review is not regarded as absolute, okay? There is no Marbury versus med medicine in Canada or, or England or in other places. And therefore, um, like the Japanese constitution, um, the, there are usually two um, contradicting articles in the constitution. One says that the parliament is screen, and the other says that uh, the judiciary has power of judicial review. So how to make this work is a, a practical problem for each country. In the case of Canada, Chief Justice McLaughlin had uh, gradually succeeded in establishing that the weight of the judiciary, therefore the judicial review is heavier than that of parliamentary supremacy. Although after she, 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 uh, she gave the uh, chief justice position to others, uh, things are now changing in Canada. But she has, uh, she has made it possible for the privilege, or privilege to be justified in terms of fundamental rights. And this really became a reality because the judiciary now had a greater say than the parliament. And notice that you need both in order for this to work. Um, and this was a, a revelation uh, for us, uh, how politics is intertwined with the principle of judicial review. And, and bearing that in mind, uh, we were thinking of how this could be applied to, to the case of Japan. But of course, um, client loyal privilege is not something with, without uh, fault. If it's used by the wrong hands, it can easily, easily be abused uh, to hide information, which uh, um, David Lubin will talk about. Uh, he was also good enough to be a speaker at the uh, ILS. Uh, the symposium that I mentioned, uh, which took place in March. Um, and therefore, um, what we're going to do is, first of all, um, to tell you a little bit about exactly what just Chief Justice McLaughlin said in her talk and where we found it, its significance. And this will be give, done by my colleague, uh, Kyoko Ishida. And then, um, uh, Yoko, the uh, Dave, okay. And then David uh, will warn us about the possible abuse uh, that this, this uh, institution um, is capable of and, and what ways of uh, avoiding that is given, uh, is, has been, have been developed in the United States. 
And based on that, uh, Yoko Tamura uh, on the far right, uh, far left for from you, will... <laughs> my mistake. Uh, and then uh, Mr. Katayama, uh, who is online waiting for us, um, will give um, present uh, the the position that the the Japanese Bar <clears throat> Federation of Bar Association took. Uh, concerning um, this issue and how uh, the uh, Federation is trying to, to apply what we have learned from uh, the experience of Canada to the case of Japan and the uh, challenges it holds. And then uh, Yoko Tamura, to the far left, uh, will be uh, giving her talk uh, from a comparative uh, law point of view. That is, she will be comparing this with the realities in Europe, as well as the United States and Japan, so that we can have a panoramic and a quite, as it were, three-dimensional understanding of exactly how uh, client uh, lawyer privilege works. In, in the case of Japan, as Katayama, uh, uh, Mr. Katayama will explain, it is now becoming more important because um, of the money laundering and the prevention of money laundering issues um, that, is, that Japan is now facing. Um, FATF, the sort of the guardian uh, uh, group, um, strange legal character, but it's not really legal in, in, in any sound way, um, but has very strong uh, actual in de facto power. Uh, has, uh, has reviews of each country and Japan had its review quite recently and it had terrible marks. And so uh, it has to do something about it. And uh, uh, it, if we comply with the uh, gatekeeper function uh, that this money laundering, uh, control of money laundering needs, then of course, the chances are the confidential uh, information of the client would be exposed. Uh, and in America or in, other, uh, in Europe, this, is, this can be avoided by claiming uh, co communication between client and lawyer as being confidential. But because we don't, okay, well, this is like that. Okay. It's getting worse. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, you know, Tom and I have been on this for 15 years. <laughs> but, uh, um, in, in, in the case of Japan, for the reasons I've explained, because there is no client lawyer privilege, um, <clears throat> you can't use this defense. And therefore, the Japanese client is more, or any client of a Japanese lawyer, is more vulnerable um, to this type of investigation. So, in, having that in mind, uh, what should the uh, lawyer do to uh, better protect? Uh, his or her client. That is the issue um, uh, that uh, um, Mr. Idei uh, of, of Kojima Law Offices uh, will be talking about based on the experience of Japan. Okay, so uh, um, without further ado, I'd like to begin by asking Kyoko, uh, Yoko, Kyoko, Kyoko. To, to begin her. Uh, <laughs> I, it's confusing. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Okay. Okay, um, hello. Uh, I will, my role is briefly explain uh, what uh, Chief Justice talked in our symposium in Tokyo in March. Then uh, I'll explain what's theoretical implication. Okay, uh, this is very brief summary of uh, Chief Justice McLaughlin's presentation. She explained how the uh, lawyer client privilege is uh, grounded in the constitution in Canada. So LCP is grounded in a confidential relationship required for a client to receive legal advice. So the client can candidly communicate with his or her lawyer and experience his or her rights in, exercise his or her rights in an informed manner. In 1982, Canada adopted the Charter of Rights and Freedoms into its constitution. The Charter gave 
gave constitutional protection to a suit of rights, including protection of life, liberty, and the security of person in accordance with fundamental principle of justice, section seven, protection against unreasonable search and seizure or the right to privacy, section eight, and the right to make full answer and defense in criminal proceedings, uh, section 11. The Supreme Court of Canada has interpreted the guarantee, these guarantees as providing constitutional protection for lawyer client privilege. In 1992, the Supreme Court took a step toward const constitutionalizing lawyer client privilege in Smith and Jones. Then in 2001, the Supreme Court of Canada declared the privilege to be a principle of fundamental justice protected under Section 7 of Charter of Rights and Freedom. Then in uh, R. versus Brown, uh, in 2002, the court affirmed the constitutional status of lawyer client privilege. Uh, Major Justice stating that the privilege flowed from the re residual protection against self-incrimination contained in Section 7 of the Charter. And in 2002, the Supreme Court held the lawyer client communication protected by Section 8 of the Charter. And in 2016, the Supreme Court confirmed its robust protection of solicitor client and litigation privilege and set high, a high standard for legislatures to, um, to abrogate their application. So, like this, uh, the Supreme Court accumulated the case law. To, uh, to guarantee a constitutional guarantee to a lawyer client privilege. So viewed historically, lawyer client privilege has evolved from a rule of evidence to a substantive principle uh, describing a fundamental legal and civil and legal right, and finally to a constitutional right flowing from the charter. The fundamental principle may be simply stated people seeking legal advice and pursuing their right, legal rights through <clears throat> litigation must know that what is said and done will not be disclosed, except to live circumstances. The ultimate purpose of the protection is to enable every person to exercise his or her right in an informed and ethical ma manner. So this explanation was really fresh to Japanese audience in Tokyo, and we asked why the constitutional basis? Then uh, she answered, the judges at that time on the Supreme Court were very determined that the charter should have broad application. So I think it was part of that broadened purpose that Supreme Court of Canada in those early years after the charter applied. When the constitutional right in the charter, that means that the court had the power to define those rights or determine what they applied to. So that was an increase in power. So we analyzed that uh, this, um, like, you know, the Canadian Supreme Court adopted, um, gave constitutional ground to crime lawyer privilege. And by doing so, um, the Supreme Court make CLP as a mother of administrative justice. So this is what we thought as a kind of theoretical implication of Chief Justice McLaughlin's talk. Then what's the theoretical implication to Japanese judiciary? Uh, we also have uh, some guaranteed rights under constitution of Japan, <clears throat> right to pursue happiness, due process, access to court, Warrant doctrine, right to criminal counsel, privilege against self incrimination. We also have these provisions, as you, you probably may know. Uh, the Constitution of Japan was adopted right after World War II, led by United States. So we have similar provision like United States, but relatively new. So uh, and plus we have big reform in two thousand one called judicial system reform, or politically it is called justice system reform. And that, that reform says that the law to be played by the judiciary becomes every, about even greater in the context of the system of separation of powers. It is necessary to strengthen the function of the judiciary as a checking mechanism on the administration. So this, this, this was the propo what proposed in 2001. And because of this proposal, uh, we had many reforms uh, surrounding mm -hmm. judiciary, like reform introduced professional law school 
and increase the number of lawyers and establish a binding ethics code of lawyers. And because we had law school, it is the first time that uh, in university we have a course called legal ethics or you know uh, lawyer's ethics. So then can or should the Japanese judiciary constitutionalize legal lawyer client privilege to strengthen that power? Um, and this is kind of very brief background <clears throat> about lawyer client privilege. As Professor Morigia mentioned, there is no written uh, provision about lawyer client privilege um, per se in Japan. So Attorney Act of 1949 uh, provides the duty of confidentiality. Article 23 says, unless otherwise provided by law, an attorney, a former attorney has the right and bears the duty to maintain confidentiality of any facts which they may have learned in the course of performing their duties. So the right to refuse to testify, the right to refuse seizure exists, but communication is not explicitly protected in code of criminal procedure or civil procedure. And there was new practice introduced in July 2020. It's pretty new. Uh, it's uh, in the area of antitrust law uh, in order to make the new such as exemption system more functional and from the viewpoint of substantially protecting confidentiality of legal consultation and ensuring due process, the Fair Trade Commission has established the following practice in its administrative investigation procedures that documents that record the communication between business operator and the lawyer are to be returned to the operator without examiner having access to the content. So this is new practice adopted in 2020, July 2020. So for Japanese judiciary, we can say that LCP is a right under development. And that is why we had symposium in, uh, in Tokyo and we have this presentation. So, and but as I said, back to 2001, Judicial System Reform Council proposed reinforcing judiciary's function against the executive branch. So uh, we have, we learned from Justice Mahlakbin and from lessons from Canadian Supreme Court, judicial recognition and enforcement of LCP can be one tool to achieve this objective, I mean, enforcing judicial power. And the enforcement of LCP through the court contributes to expand the rule of law, guarantee access to justice, and achieve justice. This is what we have learned in the symposium in Tokyo. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, just uh, two things to uh, supplement uh, Kyoko's talk. Uh, well, one, uh, the justification was made in terms of um, in, um, enhancing administration of justice. And what this means is that uh, this um, institution is no longer regarded as an instrument for protecting, just, just for protecting the, the rights of the client. It is, it is meant to protect the judicial system and its integrity, uh, and, and, and not just the, that, the rights of the client. So there's it, it, it only not, it has not only a broader base, but it covers a greater ground by adopting this justification. And one more thing, in Japan, like many other countries uh, in civil law, uh, we have uh, law departments at, in the, at the under, undergraduate level. So um, you know, people in the States uh, first learn about law when at graduate level when they go to law school. And you can't really take law in a serious way while you're an undergraduate. But in Japan, you can, and sometimes you are required to do so. And uh, Kyoko's talk is based on that understanding. Thank you. Okay, then we'll continue with uh, the David. David. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, well, thanks. Uh, I think that uh, I was brought in because I know almost nothing about Japanese law and only a little bit more about Canadian law. <laughs> uh, uh, to, so I, I'm going to give a, um, a perspective that is partly based on, on US law and uh, partly based on uh, uh, what I think of as uh, underlying principles of governing um, confidentiality, but especially the attorney-client privilege. So um, 
the United in the United States, of course, the the attorney client privilege is not a constitutional right. It's uh, uh, it could be, uh, and uh, the argument about why it could be would let, let's just begin with uh, uh, criminal cases. Uh, it would be very closely connected with the right against self incrimination. Because uh, I mean, the way that um, I've always thought of the argument is this, if I'm accused of a crime, uh, I have a right not to testify. Uh, if I tell my lawyer the facts of the case um, and the lawyer it can be called as a witness, then there goes my right against self-incrimination. So my alternative, therefore, is to not tell things to my lawyer. And in effect, I'm giving up the right to counsel. So there's a kind of trade-off. So um, this is... a. Uh, this is, um, I, I would say, an argument. If I could move one level to more to the stratospheric an argument grounded in human uh, the needs of human dignity, in the same way that the right against self-incrimination is. Now, how do we get from there to a possible uh, justification for non-criminal cases where there there is no right against self? Uh, incrimination in the United States, which does have discovery, you don't just have the right to withhold facts and discovery. Uh, this is where the argument that uh, Tomo just referred to that uh, um, just, um, Chief Justice McLaughlin uh, was uh, pushing at the Tokyo Symposium about the administration of justice is important. Uh, from her point of view, uh, as a judge, uh, I will make better decisions if um, if the adversarial presentations of both lawyers, uh, if the lawyers know the facts, and if there's no privilege, then clients will withhold the facts. And uh, uh, the way that I was thinking about it is that uh, usually a dispute doesn't get to the point of litigation unless both sides have bad facts. Uh, uh, and uh, when you've got bad facts, you just don't want to, you don't want them aired in public. Um, so, you know, this is very tied to what I think of as not the human dignity justification of the privilege, but uh, uh, the instrumental, we don't want to chill lawyer-client communications sides of the privilege, where it's an article of faith that informed lawyers um, make, give better presentations and the judge makes better decisions. So it's, uh, you know, it's a very utilitarian justification. Now, of course, the... Um, the weakness of, from the point of view of justice of the attorney-client privilege is uh, the way in which it might allow people to conceal really bad facts that they shouldn't be entitled to conceal. And uh, um, so, so I think one question that, uh, that arises for Japan, if it is going to adopt the attorney-client privilege is uh, uh, how do you guard against this? And here I think that there, there are lessons that can be learned both from the US and Canadian jurisprudence about the limits on the attorney-client privilege, which uh, as far as I can tell are, are very much the same. Uh, so uh, the, the first is you know, the well-known common law doctrine of the crime fraud exception to the attorney-client privilege. Information, a confidential communication um, is not privileged if the client's intent in having the conversation or if the client's purpose in the conversation is to further a crime or fraud. It doesn't have anything to do in particular with what the lawyer knows or intends. It's entirely based on the client's purposes. And if the client has criminal or fraudulent purposes, um, there and then there's of course the procedural question about how you find that out, which let's just leave that to one side, then it's not privileged. So so this is the first abuse is, you know, how do you protect, how do you make sure that the privilege isn't being used to uh, um, further crimes or frauds? Um, the second is uh, um, the, what is known as a selective waiver or sometimes the sword and shield doctrine. And it's, uh, imagine this, um, that uh, a client, let's say a business client, um, wants to reveal some privileged information because it's useful to have it out there in the public domain, maybe for a public relations campaign, uh, but they want to keep the bad facts away. So they want to be able to use um, this closure of confidential information as a, short, as a sword, but then uh, protect confidential information as a shield. So when might this happen? Well, one classic 
kind of example is uh, uh, if an industry commissions scientific studies about uh, um, safety pro problems with their product, and uh, they decide that they will release all the studies that show that their, their product, let's call it tobacco, um, uh, actually is not so bad for your health. And they just conceal all the studies um, that, uh, uh, that don't, uh, you know, that, that say that it is bad for your, for your health. Now, the, um, for us, this is a, a rule of evidence that um, if you have waived the attorney-client privilege by revealing the information, then you can't shield uh, the other pieces of the same bundle of information. This is in, you know, for those who are interested, federal rule of evidence 503. Um, now, one thing you might say is, well, how, how is it that you are able to conceal uh, bad scientific studies? This takes me to the third abuse, which is the one that I, that I find most interesting, uh, which is uh, what's sometimes called information laundering and sometimes the black hole. So it works like this. Suppose that I, I count corporate management hire a scientist to do a study uh, and the study comes back and now uh, the discovery is taken on the study or I guess in the in an administrative proceeding in Japan is that the government seizes the study. It's not protected. So I'm in trouble if it has adverse results. So instead I tell the scientist to report to the lawyer and that conversation is protected by the attorney-client privilege, and it would be protected under a, a Supreme Court case called Upjohn from 1981. Uh, and then the lawyer reports to the to management, and that is privileged also. And suddenly, since both of them are privileged, there's no access to it. The information has disappeared into a black hole or the the way the reason for calling it information laundering is that the information is being laundered through the lawyer. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, you know, I think this is a real problem. I'd like to illustrate with something that came up in the, um, since the, um, our Tokyo conference. And that was uh, in uh, the US government's uh, lawsuit against Google, um, when they have now asked for sanctions against Google because Google uh, had instituted a policy called communicate with care. And communicate with care said, uh, uh, no matter what your email is, like, hey, would you like to have lunch later on today? Um, CC uh, the general counsel and say that it's privileged. And uh, um, that way, uh, every communication, and you know, even if you're not asking for legal advice, sometimes if it looks like a legally ticklish issue, then uh, general counsel ought to like write a wrong, one word reply or something to make it seem as if it's not completely phony. Uh, and uh, this is, you know, this was, of course, just a, an example of a company that has decided to use the black hole and information laundering phenomenon in order to hide everything. Uh, now, uh, I'd like to just to conclude by tying these three abuses together. My suggestion, of course, is that if you adopt the attorney-client privilege, then you need to adopt whatever safeguards like the crime fraud exception or the sword and shield doctrine um, to avoid, uh, to, to make sure that these abuses don't happen. Uh, perhaps the most famous case in which they were combined was uh, the tobacco litigation in the United States in which the tobacco companies were routinely laundering scientific information through counsel. Um, and, uh, um, and of course they were engaged in selective disclosure because they're releasing all the studies that say hey, tobacco is not that bad. It's not the first big products liability case in which that happened. The, uh, the Dalcon Shield uh, contraceptive device, which sterilized 7,000 women, uh, had the company had done exactly the same thing earlier. Now, um, in these cases, the information finally came out um, via a whistleblower who releases some documents that suddenly make um, the make uh, it seem clear that maybe there is a fraud that is being perpetrated on the public. Um, and uh, the fraud is that the companies are saying, we are being very candid about the risks of smoking. And uh, we're, we've even commissioned all these scientific studies and here they are. 
from the, our impartial Tobacco Research Institute. Uh, but then when you discover that, uh, when, when you learn that, in fact, the information has been laundered and is selectively being, um, and his selective waiver is going on, now it's possible to say, well, this actually is being done in furtherance of, of a crime or fraud. And uh, as such, uh, millions of documents suddenly were unprivileged, so many that uh, uh, that it would have taken a magistrate, uh, actually it was calculated several thousand years to read through them all. So they came up with an abbreviated procedure which had the organized bar howling in agony uh, because they weren't reading every document. That's a, a different part of the story. And it was instrumental in bringing about the $250 billion tobacco settlement. But uh, as the Google story, which is just a few months old, indicates this practice is not abated. And so there, I think that uh, um, I'd like to say there should be caution involved in uh, in instituting an attorney-client privilege in Japan without thinking very carefully uh, about what kind of safeguards against abuse of the privilege should be built in along with it. And I think this is doubly important if one of the, uh, one of the concerns is about the money laundering. So I think I'll just Great. Thank you so stop much. there. Um, then we'll go on to uh, Mr. Katayama uh, with the application of what we've learned so far to Japan. Thank you, Tomo. Please go ahead. So, um, uh, uh, would you please allow me to sh share my presentation? Uh, yes, please. Uh, can you do it on your own? Sure. Uh, I can't do that. No, I can't no. do that. I can't do that. Thank you. Okay. Um, so who can do it? Uh, only me. I think if you make Mr. Katayama a co-host, then he would be able yeah. to do it. Co-host, please. Thank you. We should allow this share. So, sorry, um, we, um, okay. I think now it's available. Sorry. Yes. Uh, can you see it outside? Yes. 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 Thank you. Um, the Kyoko Ishida introduced to us um, the presentation of Chief Justice McLaughlin regarding uh, previous in Canada, and then uh, David uh, Ruben. Uh, alerted to us from the experiences in the United States, uh, the problem of uh, possible abuses or information laundering. And what are the implications of these exper experiences in Japan where privilege is not in place? Uh, I'd like to talk, uh, discuss two questions. The first question is um, whether the justice uh, system without privilege should be desirable in terms of access to the, the truth. I ask this question because the government of Japan has denied uh, privilege on the ground that it may hinder uh, finding the truth. The government study group was formed when uh, introduction of privilege was debated in conjunction with antitrust investigations. The study group, which uh, consists of uh, academic, uh, mass media, and civic societies, uh, concluded that uh, Japan should not implement privilege because 
it may not rule out possibilities of hindering access to the truth. The second question that is how the risk of abuses or risk of uh, information laundering should be avoided. Mm -hmm. uh, in Japan, uh, the lower courts uh, fully rec recognize uh, the risks of uh, these risks and adopt uh, ad hoc balancing tests. That is, um, the court um, considers uh, on one side uh, the need for confidentiality and the, on the other side, the need for the truth and uh, make a decision on a case by case basis. Uh, I'd like to talk these two questions. Now move on to the first question. The government study group uh, argued that antitrust investigators should have all information without any limitation whatsoever in order to make the most informed decisions. Here, here is a Japanese um, uh, uh, case. The Japanese authorities make it practice to wait not only like business departments of companies where direct evidence of antitrust breach is located, but also legal departments where advice of in-house counsel or external counsel is located. According to the authorities, there has been no single case that attorney-client communications were imperative to establish their case. Then why the authority raids legal departments? They do not explain to us the reason, but we can guess their hidden reason. That is, the authority raids legal departments only when the company or the client challenges the suspected facts. That is, raiding legal department is a weapon to discourage legal consultation. So Japanese investigators know that, know from its experience that privilege should not affect its truth finding. The councils experience chilling effects in particular, after the client's legal department is raided. The, the Chief Justice McCracken told us in the conference, Tokyo, that judges can make uh, good judgments only if the counsel of both sides present to the court the best argument. My chart supports the instinctive view that the court without privilege should, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, this chart uh, shows that uh, the court without privilege uh, should have more information than the court in, in a jurisdiction with privilege. But it does not mean that the court without privilege should make, uh, uh, should, um, can make a better judgment. Now I'd like to uh, talk to, uh, just uh, move to the second question. Uh, although the privilege is not recognized as legal rights of clients, but the, the lower court in Japan respects uh, confidentiality of legal consultation to some extent as a valid interest of clients. 
they developed a framework of uh, uh, balancing tests, weighing the needs for confidentiality on one side and the need for the truth on the other side. Here, uh, here is the uh, Japanese uh, code, Jap uh, the approach of Japanese code. And the, another possible way to avoid abuse is eligibility criteria for confidential, confidentiality protection, uh, such as fraud exception, uh, as David explained to us. The authority may seek the court to disclose the information if it doubts on abuse or information laundering. The court may examine the information if it satisfies the criteria. And if not, court may order the disclosure. There is nothing secret. This, the left, left hand side of the slide, that is um, the eligibility criteria approach. In Japan, um, uh, lower courts found, uh, some lower courts found in favor of confidentiality after considering all circumstances. These courts declared the investigation in question was illegal, but these litigations are usually brought by defense counsel after the criminal case is over. That is, the confidentiality has been breached when it is litigated. More importantly, the clients are not certain if their communications are confidential when they consult with lawyers. According to uh, Chief Justice McCracken, uh, there are uh, requirements for confidentiality protection in Canada. The risk of abuse discussed uh, um, uh, in the US appear uh, embedded in these requirements. The court may determine the court may determine if the information should be protected before the information is disclosed to investigators. In my view, this system appears consistent with the policy reason why confidentiality is necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll go on to... We'll go on to uh, uh, Tamara uh, with the Tamara's presentation now. Thank you for coming today. And my role is in talking about uh, where do we stand and comparative law perspective of the issue. So I'm talking about bit different things. I mean, I'm talking about a bit broader view of this uh, background. Uh, undermined the um, lawyer client privilege. Uh, so but and as a procedural professor in Tsukuba University in Tokyo, I'd like to talking about uh, more likely procedural uh, legal perspective. And if I compare views of lawyer client privilege, I'd like to start from the different uh, legal system of procedure like laws of evidence and also uh, adversarial system in kind of civil procedure. And I'd like to point out three, three things uh, first. Uh, and so uh, the first point is, uh, you know, uh, especially in the United States, you have a mandatory discovery system between parties and the adversary system in common law. And especially in the United States, you have a deposition system uh, that without court order, you can exchange information 
So that would be kind of unique in the world, I suppose, uh, even from England or Canada, Australia, even among the Mongol countries, a bit different system, I suppose. And but then in several countries, uh, mostly we have voluntary submission of evidence system, uh, kind of you know to the court, not to the other party. Even uh, we do not exchange information between parties with a court order or uh, outside of the courthouse. We just uh, share the information inside the courthouse or at the procedure process uh, after the beginning of the you know uh, claim claiming. So uh, we have to undermine or uh, you know. Uh, Focusing on the difference of the style of the procedure is in second, uh, lawyer client communication and work product are secondary materials. And so we have to uh, separate the uh, evidential materials uh, into two groups, like a, a primary materials, that means they bear evidence, uh, their facts, but bear facts, but uh, also. Uh, if you are talking about a lawyer client communication or work product, that those are kind of you know secondary materials for the uh, case. So that means they, they especially for uh, litigation strategy in, in kind of strat strategy the purpose uh, you are using for lawyer client communication and also a drink of work product by lawyers. Right? But in civil law countries, uh, those two are included in all the information. We do not separate kind of you know, materials. Uh, so uh, we all think uh, they are all information uh, and at the same uh, level. So uh, not only in Japan, but also in Germany and France, uh, we do not uh, divide uh, into two categories. So that means a uh, I think about so whether to submit to the court or not. Just you know, simple way uh, of thinking about uh, how to submit uh, materials or evidence into the court. And third point in common law, secondary materials are basically protected because you have brought mandatory discovery. You should be protect something, right? Uh, you need exception. So secondary materials are exceptional things, but uh, in civil law countries, uh, lawyer plan communication or you know uh, work product uh, included in all the information and um, also on the other way around, in civil law countries, sometimes communication between lawyer and client are more important uh, necessary information for the court to decide the case or to know the truth, because it's easy to get a, a clue or a hint of uh, what you know uh, they were discussing uh, of the truth between uh, client and lawyer. So it's an easy way to get to the bare materials and, uh, or evidence. Uh, so it's kind of you know shortcut away. In, to meet the truth. So uh, how to use kind of secondary materials are different in civil law countries sometimes, especially in Japan. So uh, bearing these kind of different uh, in mind, and then uh, talking about how in Japan, uh, in Japan, how a kind of, you know, adversary system works. So, uh, it's different functioning in civil law countries uh, from common law countries uh, because in the United States uh, or in among uh, common law countries, you have some kind of a broad discovery system. So uh, you have to submit everything if you uh, necessary or deliver to the case. But in civil law countries, uh, basically, the parties can decide uh, what kind of materials uh, to submit to the court. So uh, as already uh, Tom explained about uh, before, 
So um, they, I, I just read the point one of the thing saying Como law parties exchange their information each other and the monetary exposure. It's quite famous for you, of course, but uh, uh, this is not uh, the same system in Japan or in civil law countries. In civil law countries, each party has freedom to choose information, including primary materials, such as bare facts and relevant evidence, as well as the secondary materials, such as a lawyer client communication and freedom whether to submit to the court. And it's not necessarily to exchange any information whether to submit uh, with court. Uh, no, sorry, I mean, exchange any information or evidence between parties unless the court to do so. The uh, court orders the party to do so under the doctrine of voluntary submission with evidence to the court. So uh, the parties can control the fact, you know, uh, which the materials should be submitted to the court. So are there any differences between primary materials and secondary materials of the evidence? In common law, it is critical to protect at least secondary materials, as I said before, but then um, in civil law, each party has the right to choose even primary materials, whether to submit to the court or not. So while especially in, under Japanese law practice, the, the, the Japanese court rather asks and inquires the parties what are talked under uh, lawyer client communication to get the clue of the truth as well as to find and to issue an order to answer the contents of the lawyer client communication from the party. It has been uh, overlooked that uh, lawyer client communication is a secondary material, which is even, you know, uh, often irrelevant to the case and or indirect evidence uh, when in common law countries, especially in the United States. So the function of the kind of, you know, uh, secondary materials are quite different from uh, common law countries. So, and also different functions of the adversary system uh, result of denial to answer for the reason of the uh, lawyer client uh, privilege and uh, right to defense of the party as a court. If a party refuses to answer the question of the court, the Japanese court will likely presume and decide the relevant facts in favor of the other party. Therefore, even lawyer's professional privilege will not work well since uh, his or her client as a party is rather obliged to tell the contents of lawyer client communication, being afraid of giving negative impression to the court. Japanese courts just seem to care of finding the truth even in civil. So uh, parties could not enjoy or take the advantage of the constitutional fundamental right to defense effectively in Japan, unfortunately, since uh, they have been afraid of the negative impression by the court and tried to answer the court's questions at most. Then lawyer client privilege has not been recognized and were overlooked by the Japanese court for a long time. One of the other reasons is that in civil law, there must be a statutory law, such as black letter law at the beginning, necessary. So lawyer, lawyer client privilege and work product doctrine are not clearly stated or explicitly, explicitly stated as a party's right in Japanese procedural laws. So that's why Japanese court could not, could not find uh, lawyer client privilege in Japanese laws or Japanese uh, customary laws. So, uh, and also I just uh, show the Japanese code of civil procedure that the lawyer uh, has privilege of the client's information, but then and the client also has a right to choose their evidence submitting to the court. But still, you know, uh, as I said, in Japanese practice, a court like likely asked the party to, you know, talk about what they are discussed with their counsel in the court procedure. So that's why uh, we have to think about uh, for the future uh, at the era of globalization, should we stand on the same line overriding the different legal culture? Uh, so uh, I'd like to raise uh, two uh, problems, uh, two issues in Japan. 
Should we change the current legal attitude and the way of legal values, such as weighing more on finding the truth than caring more on the right to defense of the party in due process? And second, more focusing on adversary system that each party's right to defense should be protected from the other party, should uh, lawyer client privilege be protected even at the court as well as against the other party and clearly written as an explicit right to into statute and laws as well as speculating the detailed protection process in Japanese procedural law. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Yoko. I will go on to uh, Mr. Ide's presentation. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Sorry, I will give co-host them you can share your screen by yourself. Okay, let or, me try. Or should I do that? Uh, shall I do that? I can do that for you. I I try. I'm I'm trying to uh, share the document from my side, but uh, okay. Uh, let, let me. Teams. It's yes, difficult. Yes. Uh, yes. So can you? I think now you can do that, but let, okay. let me try again. Okay, please. Otherwise, I can do that. Okay. Yes, yes. thank you. Okay, can you can you see the uh, yes, yes, my presentation material, yes, and can you share me? Okay. Uh, shall I start? Uh, trust my turn. Uh, good afternoon and good morning. This is Naoki Day participating from Tokyo. I'm sorry I couldn't make my physical pre presence there at UCLA. I really wished to be there because uh, UCLA, I, I, I was there uh, more than 40 years ago when I was a junior high school student as part of my uh, uh, homestay uh, program. That was the first time I stepped into the United States. So, uh, uh, but this time I, I, my schedule didn't allow me to be there. Okay, so uh, following this uh, presentation material, let's start. Uh, speakers before me have given the audience the overview of the issues of lawyer-client privilege, particularly in Japan, adding the comparative law perspective. As the argument showed, the lawyer-client privilege issues have both philosophical and practical implications. My role is to speak on the side of practice. I wish to present two points. One is to share with you where we stand, where Japan stands in the field of lawyer-client privilege in criminal and administrative procedures. Two, where we are, where we are going trying to develop proactive argument based on the discussion at the IRIS 2022, which other speakers have introduced. Okay, I wanted to start with a proposition of the Japanese bar, uh, but uh, I, I wish to skip that because Professor Morigewa and uh, Tatsukata mentioned, mentioned it. Uh, Japanese bar proposes that uh, uh, protection of client lawyer communication should be established in civil, criminal, and administrative procedures. But today's, uh, the focus of my presentation today is criminal and administrative procedures. I will, st I will speak criminal procedure first. Right to counsel in criminal procedure is provided under the Japanese constitution Articles 34 and 37, which I quote here. Article 34 provides for immediate privilege of counsel. 37 provides that the accused shall have the assistance of competent counsel. Let's move on. Uh, let's turn to the legislation. Under the Code of Criminal Procedure, Article 39, which is also quoted, provides for the right to counsel's interview of the detained. It says that the interview shall be without any official being present, paragraph one, 
And the paragraph two, however, measures may be provided, measures may be provided by laws and regulations as uh, necessary to prevent the flight of the accused or suspect, the concealment of or destruction of evidence, etc. And the paragraph three, the interview itself can be restricted by the necessity of the investigation. To summarize where we stand in the area of criminal procedure, uh, secrecy of the counsel's interview as well as the written communication with counsel are protected. It is violation of that secrecy if the investigator asks the accused or suspect about the contents of the communication with the counsel. I should also note that the Supreme Court judgment of 1999 said that the right to private counsel of the detained is derived from the constitution. To that extent, the protection is fairly established in court proceedings thanks mainly to the lawyer's activities challenging the state practice through civil damage claim lawsuit, actions based on the National Reparation Act in which lawyers themselves became plaintiffs. Okay, there are certain restrictions, however. First, uh, I will touch on briefly. First, interview itself can be restricted. Second, written correspondence from an accused suspect to counsel can be inspected under certain circumstances. Third, courts tend to decide through an ad hoc balancing test with the necessity of investigation, including prevention of flight or concealment of evidence. With these restrictions, uh, which, uh, which are themselves are problems, however, uh, the defense lawyer's activities achieved certain level of protection, especially as compared with the administrative procedure area, uh, which I will turn to next. Okay. Let's turn to administrative procedures, such as administrative investigation procedure, as opposed to criminal investigation. First, there is no general protection of lawyer client privilege in the administrative field for the investigator. Lawyer client communication is, without distinction, one of the, mat the materials and the information that may contribute to the fact finding. And the investigator is almost free to access, access to this information so far as such record or information is under the possession of the client. The Tokyo High Court judgment of 2013 which was rendered in the context of administrative investigation, denied lawyer client, denied lawyer client privilege as not yet recognized as legal right. It is not an exaggeration that lawyer client privilege is almost unknown in the field of administrative procedures. The exception is recently introduced pro protective measures of certain anti-monopoly law or, or antitrust law investigation, which uh, my colleagues mentioned uh, earlier. Let me, let me briefly uh, touch on the newly introduced measures. Uh, it was introduced in 2020 in the anti-monopoly law investigation field. Under the new measures, the documents that record the communication between the client and the lawyer in connection with legal consultation on certain anti-monopoly law matters are to be returned without the examiner having access to the contents. You see, uh, it is kind of lawyer-client privilege, but narrowly limited one. The problems with the measures are the measures are applicable to cartel investigation only. It does not extend to other areas of anti-monopoly law investigation, 
nor to the administrative investigation in general. Second, strict and cumbersome formal requirements are imposed, such as proper labeling of the file and exclusion of contamination with other documents. In addition to the substantive requirement, we need to see how the newly introduced uh, measures will be implemented in practice. Having so far laid out the situation in Japan and uh, based on the pro proposition that lawyer client privilege is important not only for clients and lawyers, but it is vital to proper administration of justice. How shall we move forward? The IRS 2022 gave us some suggestions. Learning from the effort of criminal defense lawyers. The current status of, uh, as I introduced, the current status of protection of secrecy of lawyer client communication in the criminal area has been attained through the National Reparation Act lawsuit movement carried out by defense lawyers. Why not in the area of administrative procedures? That was a suggestion. In order to do so, However, more involvement of lawyers will be required in the administrative investigation processes. Currently in Japan, lawyers, attorneys' involvement in these fields is limited. In this regard, bar association's role may be important for such movement. Okay, the, the last slide. In parallel with such practice movement and to back up such movement, we will need uh, probably the theory, uh, or I should say philosophy. Again, IRS 2022, where the perspective and experience of the Canadian court were shared with us, which my colleague Kyoko Ishida introduced in her presentation, also provides with important suggestions in this regard. We need to revisit and recognize the proposition that the protection of lawyer-client communication is important to administration of justice. And with that recognition, why can't we base protection of lawyer-client communication on the constitution like achieved in Canada? The implications of the constitutional argument are that legislations and regulations violating the constitutional right can be nullified. Two, assertion of right directly based on the constitution is sometimes made possible, even there is no explicit provision in the legislations. And third, the most important effect will be that the interpretation of the statutes and regulations will be in more favor of protection of that right instead of relying on mere balancing test. I believe it will give source of, source of arguments or weapons in the practice movement. Okay, that concludes my uh, presentation. I would like to turn the microphone over back to uh, the chair, Professor Murigiwa. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Hidei. Mr. Hidei. Um, uh, through the uh, these six presentation, I, I hope you got the status quo of Japan compared to Canada, where the Supreme Court had its own in initiative to get this, make this into a, a constitutional right. There's really no political incentive to do so on the part of the Supreme Court of Japan. So it's up to the Federation of the Bar Associations, the lawyers, to do this. But if the lawyer does it, they tend to, 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 to focus on the, the right of the client rather than the administration of justice, the, the whole system itself. And therefore, uh, there's sort of trade-off and you can't have both in, in Japan at the moment because of the political situation. Uh, so um, although abuse is dangerous, uh, the situation of Japan is such that uh, before we talk, we'll start worrying about the abuse, we have to get this in place 
so that it can be abused, if at all. Um, <laughs> and that's just, I'm afraid, it is the status quo in, in Japan. Um, so I'd like to take questions. <laughs> this is an argument for a bad marriage. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> um, please uh, identify yourself uh, and then ask a question. Oh, I guess one representation of uh, Mr. Dixon. Thank you. Um, I have two points to make. Uh, the first question is, I see you had LCP and then sometimes LCC. Do you see a distinction between a lawyer-client privilege and lawyer-client communications in general, which we in the States would call lawyer-client confidentiality? They're clearly not the same in the States, although I have a far check in the But putting that into a side, you're putting that aside. Are they the same in Japan? And my second question is, do you see the likely outcome being the same in civil law <clears throat> as it is in criminal and administrative law? And what differences might there be? Okay, and you're asking who? Everybody. Uh, okay. Except perhaps David. <laughs> okay. decided the council uh, on Mr. Katayama, would you like to respond? But the first question me, I, I, yeah, I, I couldn't uh, I couldn't hear uh, clearly. Can, can you? Ah, okay. Well, in, in that case, uh, we should do it. No, no, we should do it. Uh, first of all, uh, the first question has to do with uh, Professor Tamura because she's yeah. the only one who used the term uh, uh, communication, um, and that wasn't in our script. Okay, so. Uh, why did you use this? Uh, my, my big is, is there a difference when something is going to be used as evidence for the investigation, as in the professor Professor Katayama's diagram, versus the communication itself, which we would call in the states a confidential communication that doesn't have any evidentiary relevance yet? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Did, did, did yes. you distinguish that? Okay. Yes. Uh. No. I mean. There are no distinction between, you know, lawyer communication, uh, lawyer client communication, and lawyer client privilege because uh, we do not, you know, <laughs> recognize both uh, terms yet in Japanese law. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are discussing the using the kind of idea from the American laws. So that's why, uh, based on of course, American uh, evidential laws, you divide into, you know, I mean, uh, privilege the information is limited to a kind of, you know, uh, litigation strategy, right? Uh, the, on the, uh, on the purpose advice. of legal, uh, legal advice. advice, yes. And uh, uh, economic uh, advice is, uh, ex, uh, ex, uh, ex, I mean, uh, exception, right? That means that you should submit uh, or talk about uh, what was discussed uh, among uh, lawyer and uh, clients. If it's not uh, litigation uh, advice. No, it's going to be much broader than litigation advice, but it has to be legal advice. Right, it right. At, at least legal advice. Business I mean, advice. Yes, yes. So, uh, yes. So we are uh, talking about uh, using the same kind of, you know, uh, different terms uh, from the American laws. But uh, because uh, Japanese courts do not recognize the definitions or different uh, right. uh, definitions. Uh, so that's why I kind of, you know, Japanese uh, court practice a, a bit, uh, you know, uh, different from the other uh, jurisdictions and a uh, bit behind, uh, well, unfortunately, I should say, it's kind of behind the, you know, uh, day of the world. I mean, so that's why in, even in Europe, uh, they are now making a recognition of the uh, European uh, Human Rights Charter, or, and, uh, and then they uh, making uh, definitions of uh, lawyer client privilege in the European Charter or code, but uh, in Japan, uh, we just started to discuss about you know how to uh, deal with kind of uh, information. So uh, that's why, and uh, and especially Japanese case law uh, denied you know uh, existence of the lawyer client privilege in Japan. But uh, uh, this is a bit uh, weird or funny to say that. Uh, uh, 
even Japanese lawyers uh, have the uh, privilege, uh, I mean, privilege, professional privilege uh, uh, to, uh, to do, to, to do a duty of uh, in confidentiality of their client's information. But then the uh, clients or the party itself uh, sometimes obliged to be asked by the court and should, you know, talk uh, what was discussed between in council, between council and clients. So that's why- Professor I, Tamara, we only have seven minutes more. So that's why, you know, uh, we, we do not uh, divide the kind of- you know, we have, our, I didn't make our distinction clear. We have a distinction between the conversation between the lawyer and client, confidence, confidentiality, and the presentation of evidence in court, privilege. So mm -hmm. there's a clear dichotomy that does not really exist in Japan. Right. Mm -hmm. but, uh, you're going to have to come here and, and speak louder because the, if you'll be speaking to the people in Japan, uh, they won't be able to hear you back there. Okay. Right. Uh, I, my name is Lauren Bartlett. I'm from St. Louis University and I'm a practicing attorney. I run a law clinic. I just wanted to share, usually when I... Uh, it, you know, in court and um, uh, exercise, um, arguing something is privileged as attorney client privilege. It has to do with bias. So I'm trying to protect my client from uh, the judge making some kind of prejudicial decision. So, in for example, in a divorce case, my client may have told me that uh, she now has a boyfriend, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not relevant at all to under the law, the decision-making of the judge, but it could bias the judge's view of my client, right? Or uh, also, you know, I represent uh, refugees and immigrants. And so the idea is sometimes they don't um, have documents, they're undocumented, don't have permission to be in the United States but the case is about debt collection or the case is about, uh, you know, something that's not anything to do with that, but it could bias the judge's view of my client. So I'm using uh, attorney-client privilege to protect client from those kind of judgments by the judge. It could affect the judge's decision and it's irrelevant to the case but it could be like unconscious bias, right? Implicit bias that I'm worried about. So I'm thinking about that and wondering if you have thought about that at all. If, if the judge is able to ask any question and the client has to respond, um, where is the, where, where is the, you know, wh what is any kind of check on implicit bias that, that you might have? And who would you like to have answered? The judge can ask your client directly. It doesn't have to go to your conversation with the client. Yeah, I'm gonna, the, 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 the one thing that comes up for me on to be in an email or something where I'm uh, trying to keep you know something out, right? Yeah. It could be in a conversation with me. But if I know about it in advance, right? Client is free to tell me because they know everything they tell me is confidential. Right, um, it's, it's something I can anticipate in like looking through paperwork discovery and other things going down the road. So it's, it's about well, it is about relevancy, but it's a it's a you get the client to tell you everything so you can by the client understanding that everything they're telling you is confidential, so you can protect it and try it on the road. But it's tied into this. Okay, thank you. I'm afraid we only have three minutes more. So let, <laughs> may I have all the questions first and then, yeah. yeah. So I have two parts. One is um, there's a distinction, at least in a you know, uh, majority view in uh, US evidence law between the information itself and the theft of the communication. Yeah. And you cannot hide the information itself mm -hmm. just by communicating it to, although clients keep trying to do so, <laughs> but you cannot, if there is no way, if, if you are correctly asked, what color was the light when you entered the intersection, you must respond regardless of the fact that you told your lawyer about that. Um, but the cartel, I'm very intrigued with the fact that the cartel 
was specified and nothing else in the anti-monopoly law. And I'm curious about why why that strand and whether that might change going forward. Like more, more things would be included. Uh, okay, well, we'll begin with that one. Idei Sensei, uh, I, I hope there are no, oh, there is, okay, okay, let's have you. First of all, I'm sorry for coming in late if I just put myself. Go, go ahead, go ahead, yes. Just two minutes, two minutes so go ahead. Um, the, my first question is um, the terminology. Uh, okay, uh, you have to come up here and, and shout or, or shout. <laughs> okay. And my first question pertains to the terminology. Uh, in the Netherlands, um, the uh, privilege is not uh, construed as a right, but as a fundamental principle of law, which makes it kind of immune to questions whether it's in uh, administrative or civil or criminal proceeding. And I was wondering uh, how that would fit in, in the Japanese context. And my second question is if you say that perhaps it's up to the lawyers to do this, uh, my question would be how? Well, uh, <laughs> Mr. Ide tried very hard to try to explain that, but. Uh, uh, no, uh, so have we picked up all the questions? Uh, we have exactly one minute left to respond. So I'm not really sure how, how we should do it, but how about starting with uh, Mr. Ide responding to the last question of how? I, I'm sorry, I have to, I have to yeah. run to another conference. So uh, uh, yeah. let, let, let me comment, uh, comment one thing. Uh, it is on the, uh, uh, on, on the second question of the first uh, person who, who made my question, uh, what is a, uh, what is the difference in administrative and criminal versus uh, civil? Uh, okay, in the situation, difference in situation is that uh, uh, in the criminal and administration uh, area, uh, the government or prosecution uh, prosecutor have the vigorous right to investigate. Uh, investigate everything. Whereas in the civil uh, situation, uh, as uh, uh, Professor Tamara uh, uh, introduced, uh, there is no discovery, there is no, uh, currently there is no discovery, no disclosure. So uh, it, it is a, a voluntary submission system. So uh, the situation is uh, different between uh, criminal administrative versus uh, civil. Uh, Okay, that, that's my that's my comment. Uh, I I don't think I answered the the questions, but uh, I I'd like to make that point clear. Thank you, Idei. I I know that you have to go, so you may leave now. And uh, we have thank to... you with with permission. I I will excuse myself. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, I saw hands. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, anyone want to try uh, responding to the question the, from- the Katayama sensei can respond to why cartel only? Yeah, why cartel only? Yeah, it's yeah. important. So, uh, the, um, the, uh, my colleague now um, introduced us uh, uh, the recent amendments to antitrust law, which uh, introduced um, a kind of uh, a confidentiality protection in relation to cartel investigation only. And uh, why uh, cartel investigation only? That is, uh, the reason is that uh, that part's introduced in, connect, in conjunction with the amendment to the leniency system. That is, uh, the antitrust law was amended so that um, um, if a company, uh, if a company, uh, the the uh, if a company cooperates with the authority, um, the like, uh, voluntary disclose um, the negative evidence, then um, the investigators, the authorities will credit those cooperation. That, that uh, cooperation system was introduced in conjunction with uh, and the, um, the cartel investigation only. So, the Japanese authority thought that in order to effectively work cooperation system, the company needs to consult with external external lawyers. So in the usual case, they do not they do not like external lawyers, but for cartel investigations, now companies need to cooperate with uh, uh, authority, and in order to do that. 
they have to counsel, uh, they have to go to external counsel. That's why they uh, allowed uh, co confidentiality between company and uh, external counsel. Right. Thank you. Okay, I'm afraid uh, our time is already up. So uh, uh, we have to go uh, offline. Uh, and if those of you who have time, we're happy to carry on the discussion. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Have a good dinner. <laughs> Thank you. So I, I have a question. Yeah. Okay. So anyone who is interested, please uh, stay on because uh, we have a, a few minutes uh, before dinner. Um, hey, may I ask uh, throw out another question? Uh, um, which employees of a company are covered by the privilege or would 